of work. Okay, everybody's signing on. We're gonna wait a couple of minutes for everybody to uh, get situated and sign on before we start the program. Okay, I think we can start going, start the program. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the seventh of the Legends in Flight Time series. My name is Freddie Prey, and I'll be your host tonight for the last session, this session, and the last session that's on December the 23rd with Dave Woodlock. Uh, we would like you to sign on to the uh, FFI website to either renew your membership or to join the FFI and the fly tying group. Your dues to the FFI support the many excellent programs like this one. The prime benefit to this series is our Q&A with the tire. If you want to ask questions tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page. Tonight we're featuring Gary Borger. Gary Borger is one of the world's foremost fly fishing educators. He has taught classes and lectured internationally in all aspects of fly fishing for trout and salmon since 1972. He is recognized as one of the world's leaders in fly designing. Holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is Professor Emeritus in the University of Wisconsin campus in Wausau. An award-winning author, he has published widely in sporting magazines around the world. His books include Nymphing, Naturals, The Border Color System, Fly Fishing the Dry Fly, Designing Trout Flies, Presentation, and volumes one through five of his 20 book series, Fly Fishing the Film, Reading Waters Long Flies, The Author as Predator. Gary uh, pioneered fly fishing video instruction with the release of Nymphing in 1982. Since then, he has produced 27 instructional videos, has been featured on various television programs, including his own production, The Czar Trout. Gary was a consultant on Robert Redford's movie, A River Runs Through It. In addition, Gary has been a design consultant to a num number of manufacturers in fly fishing industry. He is a member of many conservation organizations and the founding member of the Board of Governors of the Federation of Fly Fishers Casting and Structure Certification Program and was a founding board member of the River Alliance of Wisconsin. He is a 2001 inductee into the Outdoors Best VFS Fly Fisherman Readers Poll Hall of Fame and has received many other awards, including the Bud, Buzz Busick Memorial Fly Tying Award the Charles F. Fox Rising Trout Award, the Ross Allen Marigold Complete Angle Award, a Lifetime Achievement in Fly Casting Instruction Award, and others. He was named as one of the seven most influential fly fishers of the last 50 years by Fly Fusion Magazine. For his conservation efforts, he received the Lee and Joan Wolfe Conservation Award and the first Lou Jewett Memorial Life membership in the Federation of Fly Fishers. Gary currently writes, lectures, produces videos, teaches schools in all aspects of fly fishing and fly tying. Welcome, Gary. What are you going to be tying for us tonight? Thanks, Red. Well, tonight we're going to be tying a fly, which is which I call the down and dirty minnow. 
And it's down and dirty because you can tie it very quickly and it only basically has two materials. In fact, you can tie it with just one material. And as you can see, I got the camera all set up and ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over and show you the fly first, and then I'll switch back and forth to other materials and show you all the things we're gonna to use to tie with and how we're gonna do all the steps. Very simple fly to tie, but very effective. Hang on just a second. Let me set this on where we need to go on the camera. Here we go. Let's see here. And there it is. Let me get it perfectly in focus for you. And that's pretty good. It looks, yeah. Right. Right there. Yeah. It looks like it's a complicated fly, but it's a very, very simple fly to tie. That's why I like it so much. Because you can literally, if you're good at tying and you have all your materials laid out ready to go, you can tie 20 of these an hour. Now, it maybe take a little bit longer to color them all up and everything, but grind out the basic fly. And I, what I do is I tie them all first and I color them later. This particular one I'm going to show you tonight has two materials. One is this uh, extra select craft fur, and the second one is the flash material that I put in it. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to put flash material on, and I'll tell you as we go along how all this works. But before we do anything else, I want to put, show you the fly pattern itself with the materials. So let's go there so that you can see that. And uh, let's see, here it is. All right. And for those of you in the audience out there, you might want to take your camera and take a picture of this. Gary will hold it up for about a minute. Yep. And so you can take a picture. Now, while, while you're doing that and looking at it, there's a couple of things I want to point out. One is this Nymo thread. Nymo used to be the only flat nylon fly tying thread that was available. But of course, there's a lot of others since then. And there aren't very many places you can find Nymo in the heavy strengths that I need for tying these flies. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But if you go to Fire Mountain Gems, and that's just firemountaingems.com, it's a company in Oregon, and, and uh, click on uh, find Nymo, and it'll find it for you. And you can get all black and you get white. I have pink, I have red, I have rusty brown several other colors and you can get them in the heavy sizes A through E so that you can tie the big flies and have plenty strong enough thread to do that. In fact, you can bend hooks with this stuff, it's so strong. The material that we're gonna use for the body is white extra select craft fur. And you get this from Feathercraft. So go to Feathercraft, click on stream materials and then hunt up extra select craft fur. There's 35 different colors of it. So you can, you can spend a lot of money if you want, but you can get the colors that you need to do the things that you particularly want, whether it's to tie muddlers, whether it's to tie minnows, whether it's to tie um, uh, things like uh, uh, bright pink flies with you know red heads and all this other kind of stuff that you might want to tie for a steelhead or something. Anyway, they've got lots of different colors. And then I just have some pearl flashaboo. The coloration just done with permanent markers. And tonight all we're gonna use is red, black, and silver, but I've tied this same fly that I just showed you and in, in, uh, with a, olive back on it with a brown back on it, sometimes with, with uh, other different colors. And uh, I often put a red throat on it because everybody knows that a, a trout especially would never take a minnow unless it was bleeding in the gills. I mean, for some reason, people like to have red in the throat, so we'll put red in the throat. But I'll Gary, show you how to do this all in just in a minute or two. Gary, you might want to switch back to your fly. All right, we'll just go back there now, hang on. And there's our fly. And one question from the audience: uh, What type okay. of what type of fish do you fish for with this fly? Anything that wants to take a minnow, bass, trout, pike, saltwater fish. I've caught them all on it. You know, it's it's a really it's very effective. And and as we tie it, I'm going to explain one of the things that happens that isn't immediately apparent when you just look at the fly. But I, once you see it done, and once you understand what's actually happening it makes a lot more sense. So I'll explain it as we go along. Okay. Are we ready? Go let's for it. Tie, let's tie a fly. All right. Now I'm using a 7X long hook tonight just because I wanna make it really evident what I'm doing and make it very, very easy for you to see what's actually happening. And I'm using black thread, although on white flies, I often use white thread because then I can color the thread, I can color the bottom, of the head red and I can color the top gray because it's a white thread. But anyway, 
So what I'm gonna do is lock the thread on, just start behind the eye, make two or three turns forward and then back over the top, lock that down. And then I'm gonna wrap the thread back about, not quite to halfway. So maybe two fifths of the way, maybe just a little over that. Then I'm going to make what we call a spinning loop. Now this is very much different than dubbing loop. What we're gonna do is, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to back out, hang on just a second. We'll back out. Hey Gary, we have one more question from the audience. All right. Do you, uh, weight, do you weight this fly? And, and if so, how do you weight it? You can, and, and I've got another, I've got one a little bit later, I'm gonna show you with a cone head on it and show you something you can do with a cone head. Sometimes I weight them, but mostly I don't. And the reason I don't is I tie the fly on and then right in front of the eye, I put a split shot. This way I can determine how much weight I need on the fly and under any situation and the weight then causes the fly to jig. And I'll show you something interesting you can do with that too in a couple minutes. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make a spinning loop. Now, before I make the spinning loop, I wanna show you something else. And this is the tool I use to spin it with. Most people use a tool like this, which has a hook on it. It should only have one hook. If it has two hooks, take one of them off because you're only gonna use one and you only need one. However, if you wanna get really excited, what you do is you make one of these gadgets. Watch this spin. See that? Okay, that will spin it very fast. If you go on my website, you can get them for $49.95. But if you go to Ikea, you can buy one for $279. Here's what they look like. And here's what it really is. It's a material called product. And it really is nothing but a frother for coffee. So if, even if you don't have an Ikea close by, go online, Ikea, I-K-E-A, just type in Ikea, go to their kitchen section, find the coffee frother, which is called product spelled with a K instead of a C. It looks just like this. And what you do is nip off the wire about right here, bend the end around with a pair of pliers. So I just use a needle nose and bend it around. And then you've got this wonderful little spinning tool. And you can hook this in the loop and turn it on. Just like that and spin the loop. So with that said, let's look at how this process works now. Okay, here we go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the thread out and I'm not gonna pull it as far as I need, but just enough to show you right now. Put your finger on the thread, go back up and wrap around the hook, just two or three turns. That locks the thread so it doesn't move. Now, this is the step that you really need to do. And I'll show you why in just a second. You take the thread and the loop and you just twist them around one another. And let me back up for a second. The reason you need to do that is because the thread comes off the bottom of the hook, goes around my finger and back over the top of the hook. So the top of the loop is open by the thickness of the hook. Maybe not too bad with just a hook, but when you put material in there and other things, it can, it can be quite lar large. We need to close that top down completely tight because what we're gonna do is we're gonna put material in here and spin it. You can even spin elk hair in here. And if you put elk hair in here and it doesn't close at the top, it just all falls out. So you need to be able to close it very, very tightly. So you just take the thread and the loop and twist them around one another. Now let me back off for a second and make the loop as big as I need it for actually tying the fly. That puts my finger out of the out of this, uh, viewing, but there we go. And I'll go around two or three times. Now watch, the thread and the loop just go around one another like that. Then I come up and go over the top. So what I've basically done is just lock the top of the loop tight and you can see it lock tight right there, you can see it's tight. Very easy to see that, okay? Then if you want, you can wrap the thread forward and you don't have to wrap it single, uh, wrap each one tight against the neck, you just spiral it forward and get it out of the way. Just trying to get it out of the way so you can handle things. Then you take your tool, hang the tool on the loop. You wanna get the tool on the loop before you do the next step, all right? Now the next step is I'm going to get the material ready that I need and I'm going to show you how to do this. What I've done is, let me just get that and just move this out of the way and get that in focus for you. Hold on a second. Here we go. All right. Now, what I've done is I've taken some of the extra 
select crafter and I just cut off a, a clump like this. I took about half of what I needed to make the fly and I laid it down on there and then I put some crystal flash on top. I just cut off some chunks that are about as long as the longest fibers and laid them right on top, spread them out, obviously, and laid them on. Then I've got another small clump that I took from the original one, and I'm going to lay that on top. So my flash material is actually sandwiched in between the two layers of extra fine crafter, extra select crafter. If you don't do that, and you just put crafter in and then try to put, this, put the uh, flash material in, it's so slippery, it'll just flop out. So you want to sandwich it between layers of fur to hold it in place. Now you could, if you wanted to make a fly of multiple colors, you could put one color down, put the flash down, put another color on top of it, put more flash, put another color on top of that. It's very possible to use several different colors mixed with mixed materials too, mixed flash material. Easy to do that. All right, now let's put this out of the way for a second. Let's get back to our fly. We'll just get that back in focus. Hang on in just a second. There we are. All right, so there's our loop ready to go. All right, the threads wrapped for it out of the way. We've made our material to go into the fly. The spinning tool is hung on there, ready to go. We pick up the material. Now what I do is I lay mine down on the side of the bench with the tips sticking out. Don't try to put the tips through the loop, put the butts through. Open the loop up, shove it in there. Just get the thread across it. It doesn't matter where the thread comes across. Just get it in there, pull it tight. Now you've got your spinning tool on the bottom. The two loops, the two sides of the loop of thread are pinching the material tightly. Now you can pull that back through until there's only about maybe a quarter of an inch sticking out. Some people don't like the idea of these little pieces of material sticking up here and they want it to be very, you know, absolutely perfect. Well, if that's the way you're gonna do it, fine and dandy, I don't care. I think it's a waste of time, but you can go in there with your scissors, you see, and you can snip that off. There are some cool things that I do occasionally in which I will actually put material in and have it sticking way out on this side like this and then cut it at an angle so that it's actually longer at the back than it is at the front or the other way around, depending on what you want to do with it. There's lots of things that you can do. It's a very useful uh, technique and can produce lots of different things in the fly. Anyway, I'm leaving on it maybe a quarter of an inch stick out there. Then what I do is Pinch the thread tightly below the material. See where I'm holding it? Pinch it very tightly. You've got to do this because when you start spinning things like elk hair and so on, you'll never spin it if you don't do it this way. So pinch the thread tightly, wind it. Then let her go. All right, and I usually I do that a couple of times. And then with heavy thread, it won't break. But if you try this with something like 6O or even 3O, you'll break it right off. There is a trick, and I probably should tell you about it right now. If you're using fine thread, even as fine as 12 watt, what you can do is you can make like three loops right on top, one right on top of another, then close them off. And now you've got three loops, you're putting the material in there. And now instead of having 12 watt, you basically have four watt. And if you do that with six watt and make a couple of loops, basically you have three watt. So you can make the thread much stronger by just increasing the number of loops that you have. But I like to use, especially with these big hooks, I like to use heavy thread, size A through size E. Very tough, strong threads. Look at this, I can bend the hook, look at that. See how easy it is to bend it? All right, now I take my dubbing brush, or you can take your finger and just work that up. I can take my finger, for example, and I can just work this stuff up like this. But I'm gonna work it up because it's a little faster to do with a dubbing brush. Just tease Here's it up. Oh, go. Yes. You get the, have a question. All right. Um, have you ever used uh, gel spun thread instead of the thread that you're recommending? Is that? Yes, you can use gel spun, sure. Okay. In fact, there were, for a while, I, uh, Good Broad sponsored me and we did all kinds of threads and they used a, they were the first ones really to come up with uh, heavier threads, the gel spuns and other things like that. And they're very strong, they're just really tough threads. But I like this Nymo because I can get it in the colors that I want. It's very, very strong, it's nylon. It's really tough and uh, it's not very expensive. Not only that, but you notice that I'm using a small bobbin. See this? These are midge bobbins. I prefer midge bobbins over the standard bobbins because they're small and I can hold them in my hand. They're really easy to hold. 
And so this NIMO thread comes on this on these spools and I can just get that and throw them right in my bobbins and away it goes. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap around and each time I go around, here's the first wrap, there's the first wrap. I'm gonna stroke the material back out of the way so that the next wrap doesn't trap it. Go around, stroke it back out of the way. Be careful you don't spear yourself on the hook point doing this, all right? Sort of have to pay attention to what's going on. Just let it go back there. Just coax it back. All the way up to the front. Sometimes when I get up here, this material sort of gets wadded up because you've been wrapping it so much. Just grab the brush, brush it out a little bit. Keep it nice and tight, wrap right up to the eye. Now there's a little trick for wrapping to the eye too. If you didn't put quite enough material on, space it out a little bit as you wrap it. If you put too much material on, pack it a little bit as you wrap so you can get right to the eye. Bingo, there we go. Just like that. Now watch when I tie this off. I don't, I don't take the thread and then pick it over the top like this and drop it. The reason I don't do that is because you can't keep tension on it. Here's what I do. To keep tension on the thread while I'm wrapping so I can keep everything nice and tight, I hold the thread in my tying hand and my material in my materials hand. Then what I do is I go around and I cross them like this, see? I just cross it and then I can drop that and I still have my thread and I'm holding it tight. Then I can go around right behind it and lock it down really nice and tight. So I can do three or four really tight turns instead of trying to throw it over the top. Now, put your finger against the tying thread, your index finger, and push it back out of the way. See it going over my finger there? Now you can go underneath and you can clip that off and you never cut the thread. Now we're gonna form a head. So what I do is pull this material back and wrap, starting right at the eye, wrap back. Make a small, really tightly packed head. There it is, beautiful. I don't use a whip finish. The reason I don't was I learned to tie flies by myself back in when I was, well, 1955, I guess it was. And they said, well, just go ahead and, and tie it off with a couple of half hitches. Well, I tried a couple of half hitches and it didn't work. So I came up with my own knot. What I do is I put my finger on, just like I'm gonna make a dubbing loop. Go around one and a half turns. Now I've got a loop. The loop comes off the bottom of the hook, goes around my finger and over the top of the hook. I'm gonna take the loop around so that the eye goes right through the loop. That it was the thread on the bottom stays on the bottom and the thread on top stays on top, just like that. Then I can pull that up and bingo, I got a knot. So watch it again. One and a half turns, go around, pull it up. Very easy knot to use. Some people say, well, why don't you learn to use a, a whip finish? Well, I can do a whip finish, but I can't do a whip finish on the back of the fly. This knot I can tie back here. So if I'm tying a fly in reverse, or if I need to tie something back there, I can just make this thing like this with two fingers, open it way up, shove it back over the top of the hook and I can do it. It's pretty simple. All right, so let's tie that off. Cut that away. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this material and I'm gonna pull it back tight, really tight. Do you see how it maintains a shape up there? That shape doesn't change. And the reason that doesn't change is because when we made this hackle, it's actually a three-dimensional fur hackle. We had short and we had long. And when we wrapped it, the quarter inch ones that we left sticking out now form the interior of the head or body, the front of the body of this particular imitation. Basically what we have is we have a muddler head inside the fly instead of outside. And it's made of this soft material rather than deer hair and it will, it will absorb water, but it still produces the displacement effect that deer hair head would produce, but not having the floatability of the deer. So it will actually dive and do all kinds of things a lot better. Very interesting way to tie a fly. So basically what we have is we have a core inside that's gonna give us the displacement that we need to make this a sound underwater, more like a minnow to the fish. Okay, now let's put some color on this thing so you can see how this is done. Very simple, just got a black Sharpie. Hold the material to the back, nice and tight. Go right in here where, there would, where the eye would be. I'll just get right in here. And I put about 30 dots and make an eye. Then I flip it over, going on the other side, put the other eye on. Now, like I said, everybody knows that no self-respecting sport fish would ever take a minnow unless it's 
gills were bleeding. So you flip the fly over, grab your red marker, go right underneath there and give it some bleeding gills. There we go. Now what we want to do is we want to put a lateral line on, but we don't want to draw a line because number one, it sort of disappears on, in the fibers. But number two, if we put dots on instead of a lat, an actual physical line, it gives it more of a, of a virtual motion effect in the water. It actually looks like it's moving maybe even more than it is. And this is simple to do. You just go in behind the eye and put a series of dots right back. If they're not perfectly lined up and not perfectly spaced, doesn't matter. Just put the dots on like that. Now you flip her over, grab it on the other side and do the same thing. And if they don't perfectly line up with the ones on the other side, that doesn't matter either. All we're trying to do is create a little bit of, like I said, virtual motion on the fly. Now, Let's color the top of the fly. I have a silver marker, just a plain old Sharpie, but don't use the end of it. Use the side of the marker. Hold all the material back there again. Take the side of the marker, go right on the top of the fly and just color it. And there it is. Looks great. Well, let's just go back down there again and get that in focus. So Gary, you use a split shot uh, after you tie, tie it on your tippet. Mm -hmm. you, you apply a split shot right in front of the eye. Split shot right there and just put it right against the, right against the eye. This way I can put a three odd on there. I can put a B on there. I can put a BB on there. I can put two of them on, whatever I need to make it get down on the bottom and then I can jig it. Right. It's a much more effective fly being jigged than it is just stripped through the water 100 miles an hour. Now, let me show you something interesting about waiting because somebody asked a question about that. Let me just take this fly out. Hold on just a minute. Here's, what, here's the same process, exactly the same, except I tried to make it look more like a leech. That is, I put a tail on it. Let me just bring this up. I put a tail and a body on, and then I just did exactly the same thing, spinning the material on the front along with the flash material in it, like that. And I put a, a, a cone on the front, okay? Now, here's a really cool thing you can do with flies with cones on. You can do this with split shot too. It works the same way with split shot, doesn't matter. But if you like to tie them with cones and that kind of stuff, give it a little bit of flash or whatever. If you're fishing this fly right here in an area where there's a lot of bedrock or other rocky material or something, you'll catch that thing up the hook all the time. Bob Clouser developed his Clouser minnow with the eyes on top of the hook so that when he fished it, it would roll upside down and get the point up. I'm trouble with this fly, even though it's as good as, as the Clouser, is the fact that the hook's down. Well, what you do is this. Grab the hook, and when I tie them, I don't bend them when I take them, but I'm, I'm going to show you how to bend them. I take them all straight, and if I need to bend them, I bend them. You grab the hook like this, and you just bend the, the back of the hook up like that. So now it's actually bent in the middle. Okay. As soon as that thing gets in the water, it'll flip right over because the weight is now down. Now, the cool thing is you can do exactly the same thing with split shot. That's why I don't, I hardly ever tie flies with cones and other things on them because you just bend the back of it, put the split shot on it, it'll just flip right upside down. So now you can have flies that are weedless or just fish regularly if you, if you don't need to tie them, I have them weedless. Very interesting. And because, see this one's the same color top and bottom all the way around, so it doesn't matter whether it's upside down or right side up or sideways. Gary? Yes. One more question from the audience. Sure. Uh, what's the best way to fish the minnow in salt water? Uh, it depends on what you're fishing for. For example, if I'm after bonefish, you know, I wanna get, I wanna get it down on the bottom and typically I'll put a split shot on so that then I strip it a couple and then I'll roll them over, make them roll over like this. So when I strip it, it makes a little puff of silt. 
they see that boy, they'll just come to it right away, every time. If you're fishing for other things, I mean, if you're fishing for something like, uh, what else would you fish for in salt water? Redfish. You know, if you're going for redfish or something, then what I do is I tie this in a rusty brown color. And typically when I'm fishing for redfish, there's a lot of weeds and stuff on the bottom. So I'll just bend the back on and roll them upside down. Now I'll tell you another cool thing, and I didn't bring materials to do this tonight, but there's another thing you can do for redfish, stripers, and, and other things that we've fished uh, in salt water, uh, blues and all that kind of stuff. What we do is we put a loop of mono over the top this way and put three like gold beads or silver beads on mono. Well, as soon as that gets in the water, it immediately flips upside down and the beads are now down here. The thing is they're loose on the mono. So as it goes along, it rattles and clunks and bangs and, and uh, Theo Bacalar from Holland, he's actually the guy that brought the gold beads to the United States in 1994 at one of Chuck Ferimsky's at his first uh, international fly tying exposition. Well, anyway, uh, Theo tied that fly and we were fishing back in New Jersey with, with a Chuck Ferimsky for stripers and we were in the bay and the stripers weren't real big. They were, oh, I would say 18 to 24 inches, smaller fish. But Theo had these flies that he'd put the loop on them with the beads on there. And uh, he fished that one. I fished exactly the same fly without the beads. He caught three times more fish than I did. And we we're fishing exactly the same place, casting to exactly the same place. And the idea was to see if, the, if that particular design with the, with the loop of mono and the beads on there making noise was more attractive to the fish than just a straight fly and it turns out it was. So I carry a few of those, not many, just a few in the box and then I just make my other flies like that and bend the back if I need to and put a piece of split shot on them. Works absolutely fine. Really cool idea. Now let me do this before I go on. Let me show you some other ways that you can use this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie a muddler using exactly the same technique and so on. Uh, Gary? Just, yes. One more question. All right, that's fine, let's go. And, and by the way, uh, we have people on here from around the world. Uh, I think this is a, an Australian question. All right, good. In Aus Australia, in estuary waters, for flathead and uh, tailor, uh, I'm not familiar with, with that type of fish. Uh, are you? No, but, well, I know what flatheads are. If they're the same as the ones they have in Thailand and so on, yeah. Right. They take the fly very well. Okay. Uh, you, can catch, you can catch flounder and other kinds of things on this thing too. And typically okay. when I'm fishing for bottom fish like that, like I said, I bend the back and put a shot on it, rolls them upside down so they're not getting caught up all the time. Thank you. Huh? All right, let me just show you a couple other flies and some ideas. Here's one. One of the, this particular one right here, is that nicely in focus? Should be, yeah. Yes. Okay, this is what I call the, uh, the hair leg woolly worm. It's just got a, a tail, black tail, black body, counter wrapped with wire, silver wire. And then I just use that particular technique, that spinning technique and put legs on the front. This one serves very well for a big stone fine imps. You can strip it through the water. It looks like a dragonfly. It just, it looks like small minnows. I mean, it's a really, really good fly for all sorts of things. And again, it's another one of those flies. You can just crank these things out like crazy. And you can tie them on all different sizes and you can put them in different colors. Black turns out to be my favorite color. So I basically don't tie any other color except black. It's just such a good one. Um, now here's another thing you can do. You can just, you can take a, put the loop at the back instead of halfway back and take some coarse dubbing, stick it in the loop, winder forward. And now what you've got is a really nice little dragonfly nymph. And that thing works really well also. They're super, super easy to tie and very effective because they've got a lot of motion in them. Here's actually the first fly I ever designed using the loop technique. And I just want to roll it up so you can see. This is actually a hair leg nymph for designed to represent a mayfly nymph. It's got a, obviously, a, a, it's got a pheasant tail, fiber tail on it, a dubbed body. The covert is made from peacock harrow. The thorax is the unique part. 
What you do is you make the loop, you put dubbing on one side of the thread, then you stick rabbit fur guard hairs in the thing, spin it up, and you make the thorax and the legs all in one operation. And I've caught fish all over the world and this is, this is one of my favorite New Zealand flies, oh my goodness. And you can tie this in gold ribbed hairs here, you can tie it in this color, you can tie it in black, a bunch of other, other, whatever color you need. Real easy to fly to tie, again, another one of those super easy ones to tie. And then, let me show you something that most people have never even thought about or never even seen. And that is, this is a skater made with elk hair. So the tail is elk hair. I just extend the, the body forward, the, the elk hair forward, over wrap it, lock it down at the front and let, let me just turn this so you can see it. Can you see right in there? Try to spun that. That's the end of the body spun right there, all right? Just spin it, just flare it and spin it. Don't let go of the body until you're all done. Flare it, spin it. Then you tie the hackle with the same te technique we've been using here, pull the loop out, hang the tool on, put the elk hair in, butt ends first. Then I very carefully pull it back through till there's only maybe an eighth of an inch or something sticking out. Spread it out, it has to be spread out in the loop, okay? And then if you tried to wind it slowly, what would happen is the elk hair, because it's so stiff, would just push up against the body. So you want to make certain when you do this one, especially hold the loop, wind the thread really tight, let go and pull, and it'll just instantaneously form a three-dimensional hair hackle. Then you can wind it on. The nice thing about this fly is, and, and this is one we sometimes use for hexagenia because it's so big and stands up well. You can cut it off on the bottom, you got a spinner. You can cut it off on the, you can fold it back like this if you want. And you can actually make a wet fly that's sort of a minnowy kind of imitation that you can fish with shot or without shot and so on. It's a very interesting design element, design concept with some interesting design elements in it. But fish like this, you can also use it as a skater to imitate something like a crane fly. And let me give you a really cool trick for using this fly too. What you do is you take a big old leech like this, all right? And maybe even put an extra split shot on it. You hang that on the end of your fly line, I mean the end of your leader. Then up here about maybe 20 inches above that fly, you tie this one on hanging down on a dropper. Now what you do is you cast and hold the rod up. The leech with the weight on it goes underwater. This is above the water. Then simply by jigging the rod tip up and down, you can dance this fly across the surface. And what I do is I cast down and across and just let it swing and lift it up and down. And on rivers like the uh, Beaverhead in Montana, where there's so many of these big old crane flies, oh my goodness, fish go crazy for that thing. And I just bring it right into the shoreline because a lot of times the big browns are laying within a foot or two of the shore, eating those big uh, crane flies that are dancing up and down, laying eggs along the shoreline. Very interesting fly. And you can use it as a skater in other situations and so on. So there's lots of things that you can do with this particular technique. This is only just a few of the things that you can do. We need like three hours for me to show you all this stuff. So let me show you this next idea. Now this is a sculpin that I tied and I specifically did it in a, with a certain technique so that you could see actually how I did it. And that is, do you see the red in the front there? That's actually yarn. So instead of using a loop of thread, I used a loop of yarn and I put the material in the yarn loop. Then I spun it and wrapped it forward. Then I just gave an extra turn of yarn at the front to give it a little bit of a red head and then colored it up to look like a muddler. And now here's another one that's tied without that, just tied, oops, just tied to look like a mud. Let me pull all that back. Here we go. And I colored this one brown on top. So I'm going to show you how to do this one. And I'm going to show you two different ways of putting flash on with this particular one. So let's get this in there. And again, we'll lock the thread on, wrap back. Well, I'm going to show you something else. If you hold the thread at a strong angle to the hook like this, and then when you wrap instead of trying and just wrap against the thread, what happens is that turn will slide down against the last one. And you can wrap really fast, just like this. Look how fast I'm wrapping. And look how perfect those wraps come out. 
See that? Just because it wraps up again, just slides down on the thread against the last one. All right. So now what we'll do is make a big old loop there. Lock it down, get the thread out of the way. Now, Gary, someone, someone's yeah. asking, is that a 6X long hook? It's a 7X actually. 7X, okay. But it, it, you know, like I said, I use 3X all the way up to 7X depending on what I'm trying to do. And sometimes like when we're doing some of the big salmon fly hooks, uh, they're not, they maybe only be 2X. And I've done this kind of, I've done this kind of thing even on shorter hooks too. If I'm doing great big flies with saltwater, then I might do it on a saltwater hook and the saltwater hook might be just a standard length. I just use the whole hook to make the fly. Right. Simple, yeah. Okay, what I wanna do now is I wanna show you the material. So let me back this off again here. There we go, hang on. All right. So what I'm gonna use is some gold flashaboo. And then I have a sort of a, a tannish olive colored um, extra select craft fur. And all we're gonna do is exactly the same thing, but now what I wanna do is I'm gonna show you two ways to put flash on. You don't have to do both of these. This is just to show you a possibility of, of two different ways of doing it. So the first way is I'm just take a clump of a flashaboo. And let's say I want it to hang out the back of the hook about like that far, all right? So what I'll do is I'll just lash that on fold it over and let it stick out the back. It doesn't go back as far as the other, but that doesn't matter. You know, the fish don't go, oh, oh, look, you didn't put your flash material on right. I'm not taking your fly. No, if it flashes, they'll take it. So now what I've got is I've got flash. If I finish the fly, now the flash is inside the body. And if I want extra flash on a fly, sometimes I'll put this on and just leave it that particular way like that. Let me get this back to where the loop is. There we are. Okay. And then just finish it off. Now what we can do is, okay. Gary, the vice you're using is a J vice, is that correct? Yes, this is a J vice. It's made in South Africa by a guy by the name of Jay Smith. And he's a really nice guy. And he makes a really good product. And one of the reasons I have this, and I have you know several vices, obviously, more, besides fly tying. I mean, I have a lot of other vices, but I have some fly tying vices too. And more than just this one, obviously. Um, but I like this one when I'm traveling because let me just see if I can put this, hold on just a second. Let me just go down here and I'll just show you. You see this clamp here? It's actually a C clamp. And it's actually have a three and a half inch space down here. So you can put it on big tables. A lot of times when we're doing demos at shows, the table that they give us has a rim around it. And it's very difficult to clamp a regular vise on there. And then if you have to carry a vise with a base on it, then you've got a 15 pound base you're trying to drag around. And now you're only allowed 50 pounds in your bag. So this is a much better way to do it. It's, it's a, Easy to do, fast. I don't have problems with it. it doesn't weigh very much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So what I'm doing now is I've I've selected some material. I've got a clump of it right there. I'm going to get some flash material. There we go. I'm just going to lay that on top. Spread it out now. Let me just hold this up for a second. It does not have to be perfect. See that? Just slop it in there. Get it on there. We're tying flies. We're not out trying to make the absolute perfect fly. We're trying to catch some fish, and they don't care if it's perfect or not. I just put it on top, grab my next clump of material, lay that on top of there. So I wound up with something like this. Open that up, shove it up in there. And I've lost some of my stuff. Hold on a second. That'll teach me to pick it up and lay it down so many times. Hold on, we'll just go back here and grab another clump. It's very quick and easy to do. 
They use the same technique of uh, sandwiching the flash of boo. You always want to you always want to sandwich the flash of boo or, or crystal flash or whatever it is you're using. You always want to sandwich that between layers of material. If you don't, and you stick it up in the thread loop, what happened is that it'll just all fall out. All the flash of boo will just fall out. So you want to sandwich it, and you don't want to pick it up and lay it down four times while you're doing it. <laughs> just do it once. Here we go. We'll do it again. There we are. Okay, we'll dump the material on the top. There we go. And we'll get another little clump of, uh, of this material. This extra select craft fur is actually not craft fur. This actually was originated in Thailand and it actually was designed for the fashion industry. And myself and another guy found this material and it's a uh, very popular material. Really nice material. So we've got our loop, got the time, got the spinning tool, hook the spinning tool on, grab our little clump of sandwiched flash material, stick that on there. Now, some people say would cut that off. I don't, I just leave it on there. It doesn't hurt anything. Gary, they've got one more question. Go right ahead. Uh, do you always use craft fur? Uh, what else can you use? You can use, like I said, I showed you this one with, tied with uh, elk hair. You can use any fibrous material at all. And you can make the loop out of anything you can make loops out of. Now, some people may know what dubbing uh, brushes are. They're simply a loop of wire, thin copper wire with material stuck in it, wound exactly the same way I wind these, all right? I came up with this technique in 1970, about 1971 or 72, when I was trying to, I just read George Grant's book on tying flies with the hair legs. And uh, he had a very complicated way in which he made the hair legs, in which he actually wove them onto other, a couple of pieces of thread. And that weaving process was very complex and required very long fibers. He even used paintbrush fibers sometimes. His legs were, I mean, he did a beautiful job on them, but you couldn't use things like guard hairs and so on. So I developed this technique so I could use guard hairs. All right, so we'll tie that knot. Again, let me show you how to do it. So finger goes on, one and a half turns. Now you've got the loop. Take the loop so the eye goes through the loop. The bottom stays underneath and the top loop stays, the top of the loop stays above just like that. Bring it around and you can pull it tight. Let me show you a couple other things about this loop. See how that material keeps getting in my way? I make the loop with my middle finger. Then pull the material back out of the way with my index finger and thumb. Then I can go right in there. See, it's out of the way. It's not in. Then I can go right in there and I can pull with my index, my thumb, with my, I'll get my fingers right, with my middle finger back so that I can pull that right in there and just wrap right where I need to wrap it. Take it around, pull it tight. Another thing I can do is I can get it on. As long as this top one goes over the eye, it'll make a knot. So all you do is just flip that over the head like that and pull it in from this side. Very handy knot. And like I said, I just developed that when I was 11 years old because the two half inches that they said to use for the fly didn't hold it. And I had to come up with some knot and there weren't any ways that nobody in my area tied flies, nobody fished. Flies, nobody even knew what flies were basically, except things that buzzed around in the house and got on the fly strip. Okay. Now you can see how much flash this thing has in it because it's got not only flash on the outside, but all that flash that we put in for a tail. This is a, a very flashy muddler. Now what I do is I hold all this material back. Again, being careful not to spear myself on that hook point because it's sharp. Then you can just go underneath. You can color the throat. Even mudlers have to bleed a little bit, right? Then get your black marker. Put the eye on. Put the eye on the other side.
Okay, now, what we're going to do is, instead of just putting a lateral line on it, what we're going to do is we're going to put blotches on there. And the way you do that is take the side of the pen, just lay it right on there, and just pat it around a couple of three times. Just put like big old blotches on there. And they don't have to be super precise. They don't have to be evenly spaced. Uh -uh. We're out to catch fish, not spend hours and hours and hours tying flies when it doesn't really matter. In fact, if you look at sculpins, you'll never find two of them in which there's, these blotches are evenly spaced. They're all individuals. There we go. Now let me just hold that back so you can see what it looks like. There, see how nice that comes out? Now, I have a, an olive marker. So let me just get the, this has a broad tip on it. It also has a, a fine point on that side, but I want the broad tip. What I do is I just, again, hold everything back, go right in on the top and just color it on top. Now suddenly it's a little bit darker on the top than it is underneath. And there's a very nice looking little sculpin. If these hairs are sticking out too long, just rip them off. So it doesn't hurt anything at all. Hey Gary. Yep. What do you use to clean all the, the uh, indelible mark, marker stuff off your fingers? Just use uh, alcohol. Alcohol, okay. Huh? Yep, 70% alcohol, take it right off. Okay, cool. All right. Great fly. Other questions? Now, I think we're at the end of questions. So we are? Yeah, we are. We I think we, we covered them all. All right. Great, great fly and great techniques. Uh, uh, well, hold on. On smaller hooks, can you bend it up before tying the materials on? You can. OK. Sure. Yeah, you can, you can bend it and then just what I do, if I bend it before I put it on, let me just find another hook here. Hang on a second. I'll show you to make it a little easier for yourself. So let's suppose you want to want to bend it beforehand. So if I bend it, now I've got something that looks like that. Now I've got a tie going uphill. Now what I do is just bend this down like this. So that part's level because that's the only part where the fly is going to be tied. Just tie the fly on there and away you go. Yeah, another question. Will the alcohol take the marker off your wife's dining room table? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My advice is put down a piece of mat board like I have right here and tie and let the marker go on that. Because otherwise, your life might be very short. Correct. Okay. <laughs> do not get it on the table. <laughs> yeah. the, another question, would you strip retrieve in salt water? Yes, you can strip retrieve and retrieve in salt water, but there's, you know, it's fish will take minnows lots of different ways. And sometimes, like if you're fishing for something like, uh, uh, like barracuda, for example, I've had them completely ignore the fly when you strip it by, but jig it a couple of times, it goes by and they'll take it. And other days you try jigging it and they just completely ignore it and strip it as fast as you possibly can, then they come and take it. So you just don't know. What I say, what I always suggest to people is don't have only one way in which you retrieve a long fly like this. Try lots of different ways. Jack Gartside, who was lived in Boston, he was actually a taxi driver in Boston, came up with a lot of wonderful flies and he fished in, in the Boston area all the time. And uh, his best way of catching stripers was to cast and strip the fly. And then when it got close, he would just hold the rod and wiggle it back and forth. And the fly would just sit out there and jump around and all of a sudden you have a fish hook. So you just never know. I mean, I fished one time up on the, on the Bow River in Canada the only way they would take the fly was if you actually stuck the rod under your arm and stripped with both hands as fast as you could make the fly go. The next day, they wouldn't even look at it doing that. So you just, you know, 
fish are fish and they have their own brain and they're going to do what they want to do when they want to do it. So vary all kinds of things. My favorite retrieve in lakes probably, and I also do it in streams, but I also have done it in salt water is what I call the strip tease. That is, I strip the fly and shake the rod back and forth at the same time. This way the fly doesn't just go straight through the water like a pencil, rather it's moving back and forth and jumping around doing all kinds of things. It's a really superb technique. And if I'm fishing an imitation that represents a damselfly nymph, for example, I'll strip it about one foot in three seconds as I'm shaking. That's pretty slow. But in stripping minnow imitations, I'll strip that and shake it and strip it and strip it and then go fast and then, then try again slow, then let it stop for a little bit and then try it again. Different speeds, different ways. Just don't know. Uh, what One last question before we huh? get in for the night. Um, where, where was that question here? What brand of hooks bend e easily? What brand bend easily? Well, any of the any of the standard long shank hooks like this will bend. You can, I just bend them with my you know with my thumb. But if you need to, you can just grab them with a pair of pliers and bend them, or you can bend them in the vise. They all bend. The ones that don't bend easily are the super heavy wire things like salmon fly hooks and so on. Those don't bend easily because right. they're just the wire is so tough. But all these standard standard hooks that we use, you know, those will those you can all bend. Gary, we've got a lot of great uh, comments. Uh, I'm gonna read you a few. Uh, great presentation, learned a lot, thanks. Um, very welcome. Very good tips. What a refreshing attitude. Um, great lesson, Gary. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. Excellent presentation. I like how simple these flies are as opposed to the very complicated patterns that are in vogue now. So with that, I think we're going to end our session tonight. And I want to thank Gary and uh, uh, and thank everybody that, that came in tonight. And uh, remember, next Wednesday night, we're going to have uh, Dave Whitlock, uh, same time. So uh, everybody have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. And thank you for all the great comments. OK, good night. Good night.